Welcome to Emmanuel and welcome to worship. Today we're finishing up our series on grace. I hope that over the last seven weeks that you have come to a greater understanding of grace and that you've been changed by grace. I further hope that you've been strengthened and shaped by grace and that you often share grace with others. And I hope you rely on God's grace more than ever and on yourself less than ever. And finally, I hope that you'll never take God's grace for granted ever again. A few announcements. First of all, we'll celebrate God's blessings on Thanksgiving Eve with worship and Holy Communion. We hope you'll join us for that and stay afterward as we gather for a pie luck and fellowship time. So bring your favorite pie and join your Emmanuel family for some Thanksgiving fun. Of course, Thanksgiving shouldn't be celebrated just once a year, and gratitude isn't a one-time occurrence either. We want to give back to our Lord all year long out of gratitude for what He's done for us. So I encourage you to, to fill out a, a pledge card, either physically or electronically, and turn in your intentions of gratitude to the Lord for 2022. Now we'll have extra cards available at the church. You can also do it online. And you can turn them in either physically or, or electronically at any time before the end of the year. God has blessed us immensely here at Emmanuel, and we want to continue to share His love with our church, our community, and the world. It's your pledges and your offerings that help make that possible. So thank you again for your generosity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we've done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. My name is Monica Wallowick. I'm the fifth grade teacher here at Emanuel, and I'm so happy you're joining me today. Let's kick things off with some questions. What are you really good at? Maybe you said kicking a soccer ball or doing a cartwheel. These are God-given talents. It's fun to celebrate. And how do you feel when you're good at something? Maybe you said happy or proud or excited. Okay, truth time. Can't be fantastic at everything. So what are some things that you're still working on? Maybe you said swinging that golf club or doing the splits. We're human. We're not perfect. There are some things that we're not skilled at yet. And that might leave us feeling how. How do you feel when you're not really good at something? yet. Maybe you feel sad or disappointed or even frustrated. We are going to dig into a Bible story that shows us bragging versus humility. What does it mean to be humble? And I like to think of it as the ability to consider others before ourselves. Let's take a look at a Bible story. This is a parable. It's a story that Jesus told his disciples a made-up story, but it has a beautiful lesson that he wants us to learn. There is a Pharisee and a tax collector, and they walk into a temple or place of worship. And the Pharisee is a Bible expert. He knows a lot about the Bible, and he likes telling other people what God wants him to do, what God wants them to do. And so this is how the Pharisee prays. Thank you, God, that I'm better than everyone else. What? He then continues to list off all these special things that he has done and how he's better than every other man who's praying in that temple. This is bragging. Was the Pharisee thanking God? Nope. Was the Pharisee asking for forgiveness? Nope. The Pharisee came off in a way that said, I don't need anything from you, God. And he simply compared himself to others. Now, the Pharisee thought that he was way better than this tax collector who was also in the temple praying. And this tax collector, he cheated money out of people, a lot of people, and he made poor choice after poor choice, and he was not liked by many. He was so ashamed he couldn't even look up when he prayed. He bowed his head, he looked to the ground, and he said, God, have mercy on me. I know I've done bad things. This is an example of humility. Did the tax collector ask God for her mercy? Yes. Did he ask for that forgiveness? Yes. Did he own his choices? Yes. And did he compare himself to others? No, he was owning his own part. He saw how God wanted him to act. And so he prayed for forgiveness because he knew he was falling short. This is a beautiful example of biblical humility, believing what God says about us 
and putting our confidence in God who loves and values us so much. So how does God want us to pray? Like the Pharisee or the tax collector? The tax collector. We're all sinners. We all make poor choices. And God wants us to own it and ask for forgiveness. He loves us so much. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. You have such big plans for us. Thank you for the opportunity to be your hands and feet in this world and to shine your love to others. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful week. There are two kinds of people in the world, generalists and specialists. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who make things complicated and those who make things simple. I hope I'm the latter. There really are only two kinds of people in the world. At least that's what I was led to believe growing up on the farm. There were those who drove red colored tractors and those who only drove green ones. <laughs> and then there was my dad who drove red ones and orange ones. There are those people who only drive Fords and those who only drive Chevys, and those who won't drive either. And then there are those of us who only drive the best deal that they can find. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who think there are two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. <laughs> well, there were these two men who went up to the temple to pray. One of them was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The tax collector was, was a reject, a worse than a scoundrel, the rubble of humanity. I mean, he collaborated with the enemy, the government of Rome, and yet he becomes the hero of the story. It's a shame, really, that one of two men was a Pharisee. It's a shame because it spoils the surprise ending you see, when we hear the word Pharisee, we know right away who the villain is. To us, modern day Christians, Pharisee is just the Bible word for bad guy. So if you have a story that starts out, there were two men and one of them was a Pharisee, you don't even have to get to the end of the story to know who the hero is. The hero was whoever wasn't the Pharisee. The story could go, there were two guys. One of them was a Pharisee and the other an axe murderer. And you'd know that in the end, somehow, the axe murderer is going to turn out not to be so bad. Oh sure, he might be this crazed serial killer, but at least he's not a Pharisee. <laughs> Pharisees to our ears are worse than everybody. But that's not how it sounded to the people to whom Jesus first told this little story over 2,000 years ago. The Pharisees, to be fair, were actually pretty good people. They did everything right. They followed the law of God to a T. We struggle with the daunting job of keeping the Ten Commandments. Well, the Pharisees went way beyond that. They dug through the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi and found a whopping 613 commandments. They found 613 commandments, and they kept every single one of them. They went all out to do everything that God asked them to do, and to show how serious they were, how devoted. They even went further than God asked them. <clears throat> I mean, the Bible says, don't take God's name in vain. Well, the Pharisees made sure that they never did, not even accidentally. They didn't even want to come close to breaking God's law. So they didn't say God's name at all, ever. <laughs> you can't break his name if you never say it. Don't boil a kid goat in its mother's milk. Well, just to be on the safe side, they wouldn't boil any goat meat in any milk or mix any meat of any kind with any dairy product at all not even cheese. Can't be too careful. <laughs> they studied God's law and they talked about God's law and kept all the rules. So this is not some evil gang of thugs we're talking about here. The Pharisees were righteous with a capital right. But then there are 
two kinds of people. There are those who think they've arrived and those who don't. So here is the Pharisee praying his famous prayer. God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, our first response may, may be that this is, well, it's not such a bad prayer. <clears throat> it's not like the Pharisees were the riffraff of society and thank God for it. I mean, I'm thankful for the kind of values that have been instilled in me, aren't you? And so some of us could pray the Pharisees' prayer with at least some justification. But listen now to the prayer of the tax collector. <clears throat> Standing far off, he would, he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can almost see him, can't you? No illusions, no pretense. He knows what he is and what he's done. He's so ashamed that he, he can't even look towards heaven. And his prayer is an honest one. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Now Jesus said the tax collector went back to his house justified. But the Pharisee did not. But why? Because there are two kinds of people. There are those who look down on others and those who are thankful God doesn't look down on them. Jesus was speaking to a crowd who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and so they despised others. These were the folks who thought that they had already arrived, those who considered themselves part of the spiritual elite. They were the people who focused on the sins of others rather than their own. They're the people who need to prove that they are right. These are the people who desire to be served. And humble people are those who are willing to serve others. These are the people whose attitude is, you know, the church is really lucky to have me in it. <laughs> but the humble way is to say, I don't deserve to have any part in this ministry. Oh, how good of God to include me. Proud people keep others at arm's length. Humble people, well, they want to be vulnerable and close to others. Proud people in the conflict wait for the other person to apologize. Humble people take the initiative to reconcile, regardless of who is at fault, and often apologize first. Proud people don't believe they need any transformation at all. They're just sure everybody else does. And humble people, well, they continually sense their needs for a fresh encounter with God. Yep, there are two kinds of people. Those who think they're better than everyone else and those who appreciate God's blessings in giving them a better life. For example, some of you may remember Joe Theismann. He was a quarterback years ago at Notre Dame and then professionally for the Washington Redskins. Now he's a successful broadcaster and speaker. And one day someone asked, back in his playing days, why a superstar like himself should have to hold the ball for field goals and points after touchdown. After all, he's a star quarterback. <laughs> well, said Theismann, if I didn't, the ball would fall over. <laughs> no false pride, no obnoxious pretense. Theismann understood his place in the whole scheme of things. He understood how blessed he was. And he recognized that it was only by God's grace that he had the position that he did. There's little hope for people who think that they have already arrived. One of the chief reasons that the medieval church put pride at the top of the list of the seven deadly sins is that pride causes us to look down on others. It's really a, a great temptation for deeply devout people. You see, one of the problems that people have is they seek to follow Christ is that the closer they draw to God, the more clearly they see the weaknesses of human nature. 
And so the great temptation of one who is trying to be a Christian is to be critical of those who don't yet share his Christian ideals. So, how to hate the wrong yet feel love and a tolerance for the, for the one who does wrong is a continuing problem that every Christian, you and me both, has to face. Because the problem doesn't grow less, it only grows greater as one's dedication to God increases. It's true, the Pharisee may have been superior to the tax collector in, in every way possible. But as soon as he began looking down his nose at the tax collector, it's all for naught. There are two kinds of people. There are those who know they still have room to grow, who know they have not yet arrived, who appreciate the blessings God has given them purely out of his grace, and then there are those who trust in themselves that they're righteous. And then they despise others. What a great text today for a sermon on justification by faith. These self-righteous folks didn't trust God for their salvation. No, they trusted in, in themselves and their good works. And well, a lot of people still do that. In the very first of his 95 theses, Martin Luther reminded all Christians that we are to rely on God, not on our own righteousness for our salvation. But how quickly we forget. Even Luther himself didn't do any better. Two decades after he had nailed his theses on the church door at Wittenberg, he still confessed that he at times felt the old dirt clinging to him of wanting to deal with God in such a way that he could contribute something to his own salvation. He still couldn't get it into his head that he was saved through sheer grace. And what was needed was a complete surrender of himself daily to that grace. And so our Pharisee could not see that all his righteousness was like filthy rags. And at least in the presence of the righteousness of God, because we can never be righteous enough to merit God's love, because that love is freely given. Those then who know themselves to be sinners know that we must depend on God. Well, that brings us to the last thing to be said. No matter what kind of a person we are, <laughs> we're all sinners. So let no one watching here brag before God about his righteousness. We don't have any. <laughs> Let me give you a story to, to bring home the point. There was an amusing story in the newspapers recently about a man in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, who attempted to break into a convenience food store. <laughs> now the man slid down a roof air duct that also served as a vent for frying equipment in the store. And by the time he had gained entrance by this duct, well, he's covered with, with grease and, and powdered with a fire-retardant chemical that dries out the skin and throat and burns the eyes. And then, to make matters worse, when he tried to leave the store, he discovered that he couldn't get out through the deadbolt doors, and he couldn't climb up back the vent either. So, he's in prison. He's locked up. When the owner of the store opened the doors the next morning, well, the man raced out but the owner recognized him under all that grease and powder, and he called the police. Not only was the burglar caught, but now he required medical attention for the effects of the powder as well. We may comfort ourselves that we are not covered with the grease and grime of thievery or adultery or murder or some other serious crime, and yet, at the same time, we ignore the more subtle powder of pride and prejudice and neglect of the poor. None of us are righteous. No, not one. And that's why we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus forgives sinners, no matter what kind of sinner we are. So, a Pharisee and a tax collector went up to pray. One was a thief and a traitor. 
The other was one of the best people in town. But both were sinners. The Pharisee thought he had already arrived, so no further growth was possible. He looked down on those who were not as far along as he was. He depended on himself and his own good works rather than on the grace of God. A Pharisee and a tax collector. Both were sinners, but only one of them was aware of it. Fortunately, there is only one like Jesus, who gave his life for all sinners. And so, my friends, there is hope for us Pharisees whose hearts need to be convicted to recognize that there's no righteousness of our own that counts before God. And there is hope for us tax collectors who are sometimes despised by others, but loved and forgiven by God. There are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who think there are two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. Thank God Jesus died for us all. Amen. We join our voices now with all who worship God, confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, as we worship in your presence this day, we are grateful for the forgiveness for our many sins and the assurance of your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this undeserved grace and ask you to keep us in faith through the challenges of this life. Lord, we further thank you for giving us the resources to bless others with love and mercy. And so we thank you for the opportunity to send 340 boxes through Operation Christmas Child to make both a temporal and eternal difference in the lives of children all over the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who teach and lead us in spiritual matters, that you would give them the ability to nurture and care for us through the comforting word of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who guide and direct our lives in civil matters, that you would grant them empathy to human need and the resources to meet those needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those whose lives have been adversely affected by the calamities of nature, that you would show your love to them through the generosity and loving kindness of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the ministry of Lutheran schools, that those who attend may be blessed academically and spiritually, so that they may be an important influence to future generations. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are ill or in need of healing, especially Delaney Anderson Kinsner, Susan Knight, Becca Knudsen, Doris Kuntz, Marlene Laramie, Art Lutheris, Amy Morgan, Dolores Schaub, Jeff Shakatano, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, we ask for your grace upon them that they might know your presence and strength in the midst of their weakness. Grant them healing according to your will. Lord, we also thank you for the gift of marriage in the 50 years with which you have blessed Jim and Kathy Shade. We pray that they would continue to grow daily in their love for one another and for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you would like to support the mission and ministry of Emmanuel, so even more people can know the grace of our loving God, you can do so by going to give.emmanuelcl.org. You can also contribute by mailing in your gifts to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, 300 South Pathway Court, Crystal Lake, Illinois, 60014, or by using the QR code below. We're also grateful if you would fill out a connection card so that we might stay connected as the people of God. Capture the QR code below or visit connect.emmanuelcl.org. Just sign in and, and let us know that you are here. We are so glad that you are with us to worship today. Please join us again next week. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.